What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Strange Cast, Player One Vessels Life is Strange podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Adam. My co-host, Adam, is here. Adam, you here? I am. I am here. I am present. Uh, it is now daylight savings time. It is daylight savings time? That happened for us last week, I believe. So yes, we're now moving. Yeah. <laughs> time zone wise, we're back on back on schedule. But yes, we are back for our first episode of November. I believe it is. It's been a while since the last one. Um, feels like a little bit of a while. But either way, if you are new here, do please consider dropping a subscribe to the channel, uh, share with your friends, like the video as well. It helps support the channel more than anything else. And Strangecast is available on all podcast services as well. So you can check us out on YouTube, um, Spotify with a video version, Apple Podcasts, everything else. So we're all on there. Um, and also, you know, be sure to um, come to the YouTube channel if you're listening via podcast services, because this is where we usually drop the episode. Um, mm. Since then as well, also we've done an interview with Lily Hakoma, who was Khan in The, uh, the Expanse's sorry it was was Khan in the expanse the telltale series so do go and check that out that's an interview exclusive to the youtube channel um and also obviously our last two episodes have had very much expanse heavy episodes with zachary andrews who's performance director at deck nine and also stefan frost who is the game director on the expanse so do go and check them out as well um it was nice to have everyone on there in such a short space of time as well so a lot of content that so either way we'll kick off our first piece of news uh, this is also yes. a video that you can find on YouTube, which was a reaction video that I did. It was a very short one because it just came out after Strangecast, um, and we didn't have time to record an episode until now. So obviously, we're going to address it now. So go to the Life is Strange Twitter account on the twenty fifth of October. They tweeted announcing Heat Waves, the second official Life is Strange novel from Titan Books, releasing the 9th of April, twenty twenty four, which is my birthday. One more time as a reminder. Yeah. Um, written by Brittany Morris, the book explores one possible future adventure for Alex and Steph as droughts, family secrets, and buried emotions explode in a small town. So we also have like a little tweet here from Brittany Morris, who's the author of the uh, of the book. You put the news is out. Do you know how many, quote unquote, what's your dream IP, end quote, tweets I had to pass up to keep this quiet? Thank you, Titan Books, mm-hmm. for bringing me, uh, bringing me on for this project. And she tweeted that on the 25th. That was the f- same day as the actual Life is Strange announcement. And then also Katie Bentz as well, who's Steph Gingrich in Life is Strange Before Storm. And True Colors tweeted, on the same day, well, this was a fun surprise to wake up to. Steph lives on. Uh, I'm excited to learn more about this new novel and a possible journey that Alex and Steph take after True Colors. How cool. So we have all that content. Again, this is something I covered in the initial reaction video. I didn't really see much more after this or any other news uh, to confirm things. Um, but I thought we will kick things off first with you, Adam. You can take the floor here because it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on this news announcement. Um, yeah, no, it's just, it's kind of wild to me that, um, we're, we're not going back with the previous off, author, but what's interesting to me about Brittany Morris is that not only does she have works in books, uh, she wrote, uh, looks like, um, uh, Miles Morales novel, uh, but she also is a narrative writer for the Spider-Man 2 PS5 game, uh, the Wolverine game. Uh, and Subnautica uh, Below Zero and Lost Legends Redwall. So she is a, uh, looks looks to be a, um, a narrative writer for games as well. So it's interesting selection that they chose a narrative writer of video games to also write um, a novel about a video game. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting choice. So um, a little bummed that uh, Rosie isn't, taking the floor for the i'm gonna guess this is a sequel like a follow-up sequel uh to um uh let oh shoot what was it steph uh, story. no it was just steph story yeah it was just yeah. steph story um so i'm not sure if this is going to be like a follow-up sequel to that or what else it's going to be but you know pretty good choice in you know making a video game narrative writer into writing a, a novel about a game so you know good choice yeah i think i think from what it looks like they seem to be treating it's like a standalone story in the life is strange universe yeah I think they're gonna to treat be, yeah they're gonna treat steph's story as it is because it's more of a fo- focus piece on uh steph gingrich and this one seems to be more of just a, another novel but also more so on the alex story and steph and then obviously you have forget me not which comes out in december um mm-hmm. so i think like they they are basically treating this as a standalone and yeah Brittany Morris is quite an interesting person I've never read her 
works but obviously you know she's worked mm. on insomniac games and stuff and i've played insomniac games and stuff quite a lot so uh bringing someone in from the more the the video game design area specifically writing is quite interesting to take an approach but probably will help as well because i think this is, kind of seems to be like a bit of a a good spin-off from the actual game series if anything so having someone from a narrative side will probably help the game more um, mm. I did see a, one. I think one outlet I saw which seemed to post the price. It was just a random one I found on Google. I mean, they put it at like eleven euros or something, um, oh. which would be which. It was just like when I Google searched, I found like a, a random outlet which had like listed the the publication for this book, um, mm. and they just put a price. It might be like a placeholder, but it was pretty much the same price as um, Steph's story. So I think you you'd get it at probably the same price in the US as well, um, but. I think more so than anything else, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. It's, it, obviously, I, I have a funny feeling that like Katie might be doing an audiobook for it. It wouldn't surprise me. Or even Erica mm. Mori as well. Like that, I think that they did that well with uh, Steph's story. I think there'd be a mistake not to do it for this one. And yeah, gen- nope. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing on Target, uh, the Target price for the paperback version is sixteen ninety five US dollars. Yeah. Interesting. Damn. Yeah, it's a you can pre-order uh, it on Target. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's uh I think I think this kind of like says a lot about where they're going with with True Colors uh, with um, Steph and Alex specifically. I said that in that reaction video. I said that I kind of expected them to move with Alex and Steph being the flagship characters of the series, and then kind of like. So I also want to say. Are they wait? Hold on, because I'm also I'm on Target right now, and I'm looking at speaking on the Life is Strange novels. The Life is Strange Forget Me Not by Zoe Thorgood paperback, uh, releasing June twenty fifth, twenty twenty four. Yeah, so that's June, and it's for eighteen dollars. And I'm trying to see if this is like the whole collection. This is graphical novel sequel. Yeah, it'll be the I think it's the entire collection. Yeah, the entire collection is yeah a number of pages 112 so they're already saying that like um i don't know if they actually announced this or not but looks like i see a pre-order for june 25th is like the entire forget me not series is going to be in a collection for 18 bucks yeah that that, that would make sense they did with the vicelli series like they had the individual issues of comics and they had like yeah. the full volume and then they also had like i think they released like a free pack and then they released a six pack or something like that, or four five, five six they did something like that way as a combination of it. Uh, but I think, like, the, the way that Square Enix is doing this, they're kind of positioning, uh, you know, Steph and Alex to be kind of like the main characters of this franchise or at the helm of it. Mm. They're obviously putting a lot of focus on it. Yeah, and, and I, I said, uh, it's, it's a shame because, again, like, you know, Daniel and Sean don't get the same treatment. We're, we're forgotten on the kind of Life is Strange 2 side where mm. I wish I had more content around them. But then I saw a, a Dream Prison I like commenting on the video saying, at least Square Enix can't ruin life is strange to you by not addressing it that's <laughs> um, true which is always a good which is a good good thing to know at least but yeah i'm I'm excited to see more about this learn about it but i think like i think this is also something you should be kind of aware of that i think steph and alex take center stage more so now than anything else in the series and i think like yeah, other things will be kind of forgotten it's it's weird that like i feel like they're taking more of the main stage than uh chloe and max ever did like they're really going on uh, a tirade with these two characters. So um, I don't know if it's because they're like deck nine is easier, e- easier to work with and don't not or something, but I don't know. They're really marketing like uh, deck nines characters more than they don't nods. Yeah. I think, um, I think to be honest, they've probably run out of ammunition with Chloe and Max out. I think like they've, they've kind of want to like leave it be for the time being mm-hmm. be, like nine years, nine years, eight years, uh, nine yes. years next year. Yes, nine years next year, eight years, eight years this time. So I think like they've done a lot with Max and Chloe as it is, and I think like with the future direction of the series, I think they probably will go with all the Deck Nine stuff. And I think like in itself, like Alex and Steph could be in a potentially a Life is Strange True Colors sequel. We might see of a first of its kind uh, from Deck mm-hmm. Nine. I wouldn't rule it out because it seems to be like a new, completely new direction with the series. So yeah, I think like in itself, this is kind of like again, I think the. The signs have kind of been on the wall since uh, since True Colors came out. We've had Life is Strange Forget Me Not comics coming out soon, which is with Alex mm-hmm. in it. You've had 
uh, Steph's story with Rosie Four story, which is about Steph Gingrich. You have now Heat Waves. I think it's kind of like telling the direction that they're trying to go with the series and where and how far it goes as well, and how far its legs will stand as well as a series. But yeah, interesting nonetheless. Obviously, we'll follow it and obviously we'll pick it up. If someone wants to buy it for my birthday, just a hint, hint. Yes. Um, I will. I will take that. But yeah, uh, nonetheless, we'll continue to talk about that going forward. Um, should we kick into our next piece of news? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, so it's not necessarily news per se, but it's also more of a segment plus news. Um, obviously, the news is that Juson is out, so it's officially out. Uh, got quite good reviews as well. I was, I was pleasantly surprised by how like high it was scoring in different places. Um, and then I kind of like I haven't picked up myself yet. Um, money is too short at the minute. And then Adam mm-hmm. Adam has picked it up because it's on Games Pass, which is the fortunate liberties of having it on Xbox. So I thought I'd let Adam kind of give his initial reception on on what he's seen at the game as well. He hasn't finished it. He hasn't played it all the way through. But I thought I'd yeah. like let Adam give his impressions of what he's seen so far. Yeah, so I've only played an hour and a half of it. I'm in, like, crunch mode with uh, writing an album. So I um, haven't had much time to game. But with the little that I did play of it, it, it reminds me of a... Um, if I if I can describe it as like a puzzle game with a narrative, it's a lot like Journey, where in terms of like not not how it plays, but how the story is told, you you have to pick up um, different cues around your environment. You have to pick up um, not even audio files; they are uh, letters uh, written to you, like written to other people about like the excitement that they have for the new world or something like that. And you saw. Uh, seems to be an event that has occurred uh, it, within the world that's uh, that's told. So it looks like you're excava- uh, excavating uh, a site that that was within the event of Jusant. And the game mm-hmm. even opens up with the French terminology of what Jusant is, which is a receding tides. So it seems like it was the event that had occurred. Uh, the gameplay, I will say, is super smooth. Like, it is not that hard to pick up, and it's not that frustrating to even, like, understand what's going on. But it's challenging enough where you really have to actually think about where you're going to swing and uh, where you're going to pu- uh, put your stakes and all of that. But I will say that the gameplay is as smooth as it can possibly get. So in terms of like a smaller game it's it's really well executed um i do want to finish it when i do have the time but for from what i've played it's um it's actually super smooth and it's um it, it's a narrative design that's you don't really see a lot anymore but it doesn't really hold your hand and to say like hey this is what's going on you actually have to go out of your way mm-hmm. to pick up cues of what the story was so I will finish it eventually because it is a game that's uh, nice and calming, but at the same time, it is still a puzzle game nonetheless. So you're not chilling like you did in, um, well, I won't, I won't even say Journey was chill in that way because Journey had its own challenges too. But, um, but if you, if you liked Abzu, if you like Journey, if you like Greece, um, I think this is a good pickup, and if you like smooth gameplay about climbing, and there's no fall damage either. I tested it. There is no fall damage. You can just fall down, pick yourself back up. Um, and there's <laughs> there is a uh, points where you can like uh put your stakes in and save where you spot. And um, if you if you in case you fall down, there's a spot that you can like put your stake in. And you can save yourself from like like climbing any further because now your stake is in one certain place. So it's a very forgiving game, um, but it is a puzzle game nonetheless. So, but so far from what I played, it's a pretty pretty good game. That was really interesting. I've, I've, I think you said you were about an hour and a bit into it. Yeah, about an hour and a half. Like I didn't really yeah. have that much time. How, how far do you think that is in the story? Because I've seen like a couple of people getting a bit critical about how long it is. They said it's about four or five hours the game. To be honest the main story um okay so i i hate when people say like oh it's only four hours um because okay this is the artist me coming out um with a lot of people and and you know when i asked um uh i didn't ask zach andrew this i asked frostus uh why is the game much shorter um and he said like more 
uh, quantity within that time or, or not quantity or quality within that time frame. But it's also like you put the, all, all this time, all this effort, uh, months and months, years and years of work just to be condensed down to like four or five hours. I think people don't see the bigger picture in what a game can be. It, the story might be four hours right but did you yeah. really pick up absolutely everything is there something you missed is there a collectible you didn't find um this seems like the type of game that's if you played through it once you haven't picked up everything like if you, if you actually like beat the story um much like life is strange where you said like oh yeah i beat life is strange i'm like yeah but did you do everything in life is strange um actually you know what's a better question how long to beat uh Jusan? and then like let's look up the completionist rating uh yeah it says four hours but the completionist is nine and a half hours so it's 10 hours so it's a 10 hour game so you beat it in four hours but like did you really pick up everything in the game so i don't know I don't think people should be worried about that's only four hours because it, it's a 10 hour game. Plus, you know, it's only 25 bucks full price. It's only 25. So it's not, it's, it's not like a $60 price point and they're like asking you a lot. And it's just a really fun, smooth game in of itself. So I don't know. People are just nitpicky about everything uh, <laughs> and they don't see like the bigger picture of it. How how do you think it compares to the other Don't Know games so far? What you played? I, I remember reading one review where it said that it's probably their best game since Life is Strange, to be honest. Um, and then obviously it feels quite out there. There's a different concept compared to the other games. How you, how well, would you compare it to the others just on what you've seen so far? Well, to say it's a, the best game, I mean, it depends who you are. Because again, uh, I played through uh, Fall of Reverie. And that game is really good in terms of a graphic novel. So if you like graphic novels, you're going to say that's the best game since Life is Strange. Uh, Life is Strange, like, I would like to say that is based around a graphic novel style. So if you liked Life is Strange, you're going to like Fall of Reverie. But at the same time, Gerda was just so out there in terms of, like, a very niche audience. And same thing for Fall of Reverie. It's for a very niche audience. Jusan, I think it is getting this kind of like review of like being the best game since Life is Strange because it can reach such a broad range of people. It's yeah. a small narrative puzzle game about climbing. It's it's less less niche. It is niche, but it's it's a little bit more broad. Like you can actually like recommend this to somebody. Uh like recommend it like really any gamer versus um <coughs> Gerda is about very dark time in history and fall of reverie is for a very very small sector of gamers at, at least in america because japan loves loves graphic novels uh not graphic novels visual novels yeah but it's it's very big in japan but here it's a very small sector uh whereas jusan i think you can recommend it to way more people than any other game that donut has put out Okay, no, that's interesting. The other yeah. question is, is it something that I would like? That's the big smear I, test plus. Yeah, that's the thing. It's just like, I want, to, like, here's the thing. I want to play this game. I just haven't had too much time. And I think, I think I can recommend this to you. And I can recommend this to a lot of people just because one, for, for three points mainly. Uh, one, there is no fall damage. So it's not like that frustration where like, you fall from a cliff, you die, and you have to wait for a load screen, blah, blah, blah. So you can just, like, fall down but keep climbing, right? Uh, point number two is that the gameplay is super smooth. Like, it's so smooth. It's not frustrating in a way of just, like, like oh, my, my, my hand glitched out of nowhere. It's, it's very satisfying. It's very satisfying gameplay. Um, and number three, it just, it's... It, the story doesn't take too much away from your gameplay. Like, it doesn't interrupt you. There's not a ton of cutscenes from what I've played. Um, and you control how the story is picked up. If you don't want to read any story, that's on you. You can just keep climbing. If you do want to re read story, that's on you. You can go pick up more letters and, like, find out, like, about Jusan. But the fact that it's 
forgiving in that way, I think I can recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that's yeah. that's all seems interesting. Obviously, again, like Juson is out. I'll, I'll probably look at picking up when it comes down in price. Um, I imagine I've got yeah. to sell very soon. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think at the end of the game once you finish it as well, because I've seen kind of like I've seen both uh, really glowing reviews and also some like negative reviews and parts. So I'm kind of interested by it. But it's, it's an interesting concept though. Knock knock. It's one of their self-published games, so I think like it gives them a bit more. Mm-hmm. A bit more clear direction of what they kind of want to create but yeah we'll follow you yeah i think this is this is definitely gonna feel like a don't nod game like it is definitely gonna feel like it more than fall of reverie did fall of reverie was just so out there but this is gonna feel like a don't nod game more than anything else it is even story or like gameplay or or what would you kind of associate gameplay um because the story is uh so far from what i've seen so far it's uh, it, it's reminded me a lot of like Greece uh, and that kind of story, but uh, I would say like the gameplay and even the graphics because the art designer, oh damn it, uh, Edward the, Kaplan. Thank you. Uh, but he was the art director behind Life is Strange, so even the the look of the game is gonna feel more Life is Strange than anything else. So I think the gameplay is gonna feel more uh, adjust the, the the look of it. It's gonna feel more familiar. But uh, whereas Fall of Reverie, I think it's for a very select group of people in America and Britain, probably. But and then also uh, Gerda is very select. But this feels more don't nod than anything else. Okay, okay. And I think that's why people are saying it's the best one since Life is Strange, because it feels more familiar uh, yeah. more than anything else. What's the um, what's the music like during like gameplay? Um, I, I hate this person. It makes really? me feel like I'm not good enough. Like it's actually <laughs> that's the other reason why I want to play this game because okay, let me see if I can pull up the person uh who makes it because it's very there we go. Hell yes. Um I'm pr- I'm okay, so I'm gonna slaughter this name. Okay. I'm gonna slaughter it. <sighs> Because even Liz read it. Like, I looked this person up, and I was just like, oh, boy. Gil... Gil... Guillaume... Guillaume Ferran? Guillaume Ferran? I'm hoping. Okay. Uh, But looks like this is his first game. Like, everything else is, like... uh, Looks like a short story. But I believe this is his first, like, game soundtrack. Everything else... Is albums or, um, yeah, it, it, it's like a short story, like a like a film kind of thing. But this is his first like actual game, and it is incredibly cinematic. Like even just the opening was just oh, um, really? yeah, it's wild. So no, it's really good and really smooth. It reminds me a lot of uh, Berlinist, so I'm going back to Greece on that one. But if you listen to Berlinist, <laughs> it reminds me a lot of um, of their music, as well as, um, of course, um, uh, the uh, Greek composer behind Hugh. But yeah, no, it's he's very good. It's, the The whole soundtrack is incredible so far. I've never actually heard of him. I'm just looking him exactly, up now. yeah, like he's this is his first one. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I do always I find it quite interesting that the don't know composers that they bring in for their games. It's quite a quite an interesting one to see. Is he is he French? I would assume he's French. Um I'm gonna guess yes. Gil Guillaume. Guillaume. If it's not, then um probably Spanish, maybe. Yeah, there's no bio or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, look at his IMDB, it's very limited credits. It's like very uh like short films. Uh, short TV, short films, TV mm. series, Chronicles of Son, which is the one that he worked as a composer, and then uh, seems very, uh, Yeah, it seems very French. Like the films that he's working on as well. Okay, yeah, okay, that's yeah. quite cool. That's quite cool. That's what I mean. Like I saw his name and I was like, I'm not even going to attempt to try to say this. But yeah, no, it's it's a really excellent soundtrack so far. Uh, but yeah, of course he does like great work on it, and I think it fits the feel of what the game is and what the game should feel like. Um, 
And what makes a good soundtrack is that it's, it's there without being there. It's there yeah. without being too overpowering. It's a lot like putting salt on a dish. It brings out the flavor, but if you overpower it, it's going to be like too salty. Uh, I think this reaches a good balance of being present while also not being present at the same time. Okay. Okay. Right. We'll keep a close eye on Jason going forward. And obviously, we'll probably circle back once you finish it as well, just to hear your full thoughts. Definitely. Um, yeah. It'll be quite cool to hear. But yeah, interesting to see that. That's one of obviously Don't Know's mainline games that they're releasing. They finally got out before the end of 2023. So uh, do pick up Jusar. It is available to check out. Uh, should we move into our next topic? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So this is news again, but also a little new segment, which was that Archangel has dropped, which is the DLC segment for uh, The Expanse. Um, I didn't expect this to drop until 2024. For some reason, I kept thinking it was 2024 it was going to drop. Um, yeah. But it is out. It is available part of... Uh, you can buy it separately, or you, if you have bought the kind of like complete edition, whatever it was, you basically get it included. Um, and this is not like the main game. You're not Kamina Drummer in this. You are uh, Christian Avasarala. I believe I got her name right there, um, which took me a while mm-hmm. to kind of remember. So you kind of focus on this other character in the Expanse universe. Um, uh, do you want me to start things on this? Yes, I'm also trying to look for, like, I I I swore to that it said February 2024, and I'm trying to find an article that said, like, it said 2024 because I swear at the same time. Oh no, it says I see an article from July. Archangel launches this fall, including. Am I stupid? Because like you, that's the thing. I think like, it might I be thought, in, um, I think it might be in store descriptions that put that. <laughs> Do you like the PS yeah. store and the Xbox store? They might have put like fall twenty twenty four. I'm I'm sure it was like fall, not fall. Um, it was like early twenty twenty four. Yeah, I the thought release so was. too. Because I was kind of but... surprised that it just dropped out of nowhere. They like put a tweet out, a uh, Telltale saying that Archangel's available, and I was like, what? I was like, I was not expecting this until next year. I was like, kind of a little bit caught off guard. Yeah, and then it says I see another one from earlier this year as a release for the expanse telltale series uh, blah, blah, blah. yeah it's also saying fall am i stupid i guess so <laughs> yeah no i definitely thought it was going to be like early 2024 yeah 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 it was it was it, yeah it just kind of came out of nowhere so i kind of like jumped on it as soon as possible um and obviously having spoken to yeah, zach andrews speaking to zach andrews and also Z- F- stefan frost <laughs> We're kind of informed that this is a different experience. It's a very different experience. Obviously, as I said, you play as Christian Avasala, um, who's a character from the Expanse, mm. and it's less, uh, less, uh, you know, actiony as as the rest of the ex- Expanse. And I kind of, it's kind of kicked things off. I really liked it. I really, yeah. really liked it. Like I've, I've always basically said like those kind of like mo- those kind of like DLC episodes or those kind of episodes in general are kind of the things that I always wished that Game of Thrones was, where it was more diplomatically mm. politics driven, if anything. Yeah. Uh, because Christian Avasala is basically like she's a politician, isn't she? And I love mm-hmm. that the kind of the premise is that you're you're playing like chess, essentially, metaphorically and physically in that game. And physically, yeah, yeah. So it's like you're basically like navigating this like really treacherous world of the expanse, and and uh, and uh, in itself is Ashore Agudashlu. I believe that's her name. Mm-hmm. Pronounced properly, she is outstanding. She's got such oh, yeah. a she's such a great actress. Like her. I love that the fact, like, you know, we have Kamina Drummer's voice, and you have, like, her voice as well for, like, um, a Christian. It's just, there's something with it, with the way that they put their voices on. Um, but, yeah, generally speaking, it's, like, it's a relatively short experience again. And I think, like, do you know what? Well, I make the argument this one. I think it's better that it is short, this one. It doesn't yes. need to be, it doesn't need to be as long as, like, it could even be even shorter than the main expanse, like, episodes. I feel like it doesn't need to be as long. But interesting how far I, like, obviously I got to the end. I won't spoil it because you, you, haven't, you haven't finished it yet. I think you'll find it quite interesting how it plays out. But mm-hmm. I, I read it online in like forums and stuff. People were kind of like, um, I kind of expected it the way that it went because I already know more about the character. I know nothing about it. And like, the kind of ending caught me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, I, 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 I really, really enjoyed what I played from it. Great acting, great performance direction for Zachary Andrews, as always. Uh, he was great on the expanse in general with that. Uh, and then just it, as well with that show race performance is great. I love that. I, I just think it gives you a, having not played, having not watched the TV show, read any of the books mm-hmm. and stuff. I like that I've connected with this character very early on in like a prequel sense. So I feel like when I get to the show and when I watch the show, 
I'll be able to like feel a bit more kind of comfort in knowing that I know something about this character before I start watching it. Yeah, I was about to say the ending does set up something within the show. Like it does like set up and even like kind of like wink winks at you like, oh, you know, check out the show. Um but yeah, like I she's definitely a prominent character in the books as well. Um so while you loved it, I was just like, I am not a politics person at oh, all. And that's not. and that's the thing, it's just like when I say like like oh it's political it's like not not like you know red hat with white text kind of saying like like oh keep your politics out of video games like no it's literally politician the game and it's just like um i didn't enjoy it because i didn't i don't enjoy politics um this is going back to my youth ministry days and i had to play politics with like three different committees and get everybody to do their votes and just like oh my god can we just like get on with this um because of course there's a segment of this dlc where you need enough votes and you're calling all these people who are potentially voting for you and they're like well you have i will vote for you if you do this and then the next call i like i will vote for you if you do and an opposite of what the other person wants to do and i'm just like oh my god dude do we have to and of course christian's like whatever it is whatever you need i will do it and just like if you want to know what like like if you if you go into american politics and you're like why why are they so flip-floppy play this dlc and you'll you'll figure out why everybody's so (laughs) flip-floppy in politics because they're trying to keep their votes going so they're like yeah totally that that's my opinion too yep definitely yep 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 definitely yeah um also, she went for two drinks in this DLC. Two drinks in the same night. I was like, okay, That's wow. That's true, yeah. 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 I was, she's like, oh, I'm ready for a break. I'm like, girl, it's been 40 minutes. What are you talking about? It's yeah. been 40 minutes. You're like, I need another whiskey. I'm like, me too, girl, but like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it reminds me very much of House of Cards when you do the voting system. Uh, like yeah. the, early, the early House of Cards seasons from like the Netflix series. It's like the way that you're like diplomatically playing with like other people. And for me, mm. that is the kind of game that I like. And for anything, I like that kind of like the bit of strategy, politics kind of thing. That's why I found really interesting in the early seasons of Game of Thrones, if anything. And kind of fell off with it. So it is completely different. It's kind of like a bit in, in, in the entire package of The Expanse. It feels quite interesting to have as well because you have like five episodes around Camino Drummond, which is like a main story, kind of like mm-hmm. adventure kind of thing. And you have this like DLC piece, which is like on this other character, Christian. It's like more so like a, the diplomatic politics side of The Expanse. Um, yeah. So I was kind of like, I was quite, I was kind of like, yeah, I, I was, I was 50, 50. I was like meditating for a lot of it and thinking of my thoughts. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because like most of the, most of the episode is set in like in a room more so. And then you're basically like yeah. doing repetitive things where it's like, you do this, 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 and that and everything else. But it's kind of like, a, it reminded me a lot of, um, lab- uh, uh, wavelengths and like, yeah, you're just in the same room. Yeah. Which is another deck nine DLC. Yeah, it, it was similar in that sense. Like, it was just limit. I, I kind of like the fact that we were just in that room because I think, like, mm. with zero, zero understanding who Christian is, I feel like I know a lot more about her. Um, I don't know how that will kind of flip in the sense that I, I wish maybe if I were, should I have watched the TV show first or should I have, like, played the game afterwards? I, I'm kind of interested to see how that plays yeah. out. Um, but nonetheless, um, it, it was an interesting piece of DLC to put in there. Um, I, I feel like in itself as well, I think like they could have even like expanded that as well had they like had a bigger project in place for this. Where they could have had like do you know what we talked about with true colours? It would have been great to have like um a wavelengths DLC but for like different characters. So you had like three sub story like DLCs for different characters and then worked off that. So I feel like Christian Avasal is great, but mm. it would have been cool to have like two more pieces that we could have looked forward to with different characters from the expanse and then kind of run with those, but that's just wishful thinking, like longer term things. But yeah. I would recommend the expanse now. I think after like playing it through, like as as you said mm. repeatedly, this will age better because you can buy it in full now. So that like, once you play it in full, you can just basically storm through the first five episodes, enjoy it all it is, and you can even play Archangel as well, and then kind of yeah. get another bit of content with it. But <laughs> um, in a nutshell, I enjoyed most of the expanse. I think like my main issue, if anything, was like the uh, the the length of the game. I think it was just a little bit too short each episode, um, and I think more so because I wanted a bit mm. more content to experience with it, but. Archangel, I think, was actually probably the best in terms of length-wise because it didn't need to be any longer than it was. It was kind of like, yeah, here's the content. 
just enjoy it. You can kind of get through it very quickly, but all the other side stuff's that as well. But enjoyed it nonetheless. Do you, oh, sorry, yeah. do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I just said like um, I was just gonna say like I think it adds a lot uh, in terms of like I, I think it would make the DLC worth like getting deluxe edition just because yeah. um, it's just more of the expanses you like already. So. And plus, it does set up the show really well. Like, it, it sets up, like, more characters within the show. Uh, so if you're interested in the Expanse series, I think it's a, it's a good way to put in. And if you like politics, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great one to go with. Also, as well, I really like the Expanse's theme. It is dope. Yeah. I think it's really dope, that theme. I've listened to it so many times now. I'm like, that's mm. actually, like, top quality for introduction for a show. It plays every time in the menu, but I wanted to add that in. It's just a random random two cents if anything um we'll move into our main topic then uh so that's all our news not as much news but just as you will and segments included um so we're going to kind of like focus our news piece our main segment for the show on uh chloe price i thought it'd be worth talking Mm -hmm. about chloe Uh, i think i kind of got this inspiration if anything from uh the episode we did on max because we talked about max quite a while and i think like we haven't really had a lot of conversations about chloe i think more so about chloe in general like passing by in other conversations but i kind of wanted to bring this up because i had a friend who played life is strange and he hated chloe like he hated her guts did not like her in any way shape or form yeah just didn't like her at all yeah was not relating to her really hated her really hated her in life is strange one um then when he got to bts he just he just couldn't connect with her didn't like her at all and like bts was kind of like a bit of a hit one for him but it's also kind of like a bit of a bigger conversation with Chloe. It's like the kind of conversation, is she misunderstood or is the criticism fair? I think Chloe Christ is a very divisive figure. I think it's easier to meet people who like Chloe and then kind of like obviously have the kind of like the shipping thing with Max and Chloe. But then I think I've also seen people who don't like Chloe and have like made it very clear why they don't like this character. Uh, so do you want me to start the conversation or do you want to like take rain here? Yeah, no. Um, I don't understand like what all this hate is for 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 chloe and i think it's more because maybe we're in a different context of where we were because back in uh when did this game come out 2015 right yeah 2015 yeah um i think the whole skater punk aspect you know was a little bit more enlightening i guess i i think it was a little bit more pain involved um it was pre uh it was pre-trump so like you know, we had a lot of like more sane people around, uh, at least in America. So I, I think maybe like cultural context has changed on what Chloe is. Like more radical people are seen in a different light in 2023 than they were in 2015. So that could be it. But the other side of it is that like I, I don't think people understand what Chloe is going through because she is, um, on the outside of things, she is a very brash person. She is a very um, thinking that the world is hers and the world is always hurting her and nobody understands why. And I think Before the Storm really explains it well of why she was. But if you don't play Before the Storm, if you're just focused on uh, Chloe uh, within the game realm, then I think she comes off a little bit um, narcissistic and she comes off a little bit um harsh so i think context matters both in the game's culture and as well as america's culture as well like just the outside culture of video games do you think um bts does a better job making her more likable if anything because i feel like there's like scenes where they make her a lot more kind of understanding and sympathetic i think there's like scenes where they have like max sending her text and she doesn't reply well she sends Mm -hmm. that text to max and she doesn't reply it kind of gives it a bit more of a, a bit of a deeper focus, if anything. I was just wondering, do you feel like BTS does like more, does better for her in terms of like making her like a bit more kind of like winning over the critics, or do you think it's just the damage is already done at that point? Where the, if you like Chloe or not, it's kind of going to be, it's not going to change your mind. I think we only see Chloe as better in Before the Storm because she was pre Chloe as as we were, like we were just in a transition, so she was still like just a science nerd trying too hard to be tough, you know? So we didn't really get that brashness that I was explaining before. We didn't really get that from her until Life is Strange. So I think to say that 
before the storm made her likable. I don't want to give that the credit because we did get Chloe when she was likable. You know, I, I think the whole point of Chloe Price in Life is Strange, right? Like the whole point of her is that she is very much, um, you know, arms distance kind of person. She is a very much like um, the world is like a hateful place in Life is Strange. But in Before the Storm, we got that before, like she was that way. So I don't think Before the Storm made her a big, better person. I think she, she was just written like pre that way you know i don't know if that makes any sense no i get what you mean i, I mean also in the sense of before so do you think it helps people win her over a little bit more because they kind of add oh yeah context to like the max relationship yeah definitely it definitely does um especially farewell farewell explains so much um and i think that's why i think people should play before the storm here's a bigger question uh, should they be playing before the storm before or after life is strange? Cause I'm always in the argument of like, I think after still, uh, yeah, because you do get, I, I think in terms of like, as a narrative writer, um, you want the audience to hate the person that you're already trying to set up to be like, Hey, forgive this person. Uh, rather than like, the the context of like oh she was a nice person before and now she's bad you know i i feel like there's a more impact when you're trying to understand where a person's coming from you know that is brash rather than like seeing the downfall there there's a much more impact in that so when when you when you say like did before the storm make her a better person i think they did but the biggest question is should they be playing before the storm before or after life is strange I'm a, I'm I'm a purist for like order to play it, and I'm I'm like you should play it really stay order if anything. Yeah. Um, I don't like I don't like doing the prequel kind of like thing. With, I I think like for me I think like the problem is with with Life is Strange is it depends when you play it and how much you know about it. So like mm -hmm. when I played it, I'd like followed it beforehand. I'd like covered it, and the kind of the main focus point of that story is a coming of age story for Max Caulfield. So. Mm -hmm that's the kind of premise that sets it up already in 2015 it's this this coming of age story of this young girl who reconnects with her friend five years later now mm -hmm. i don't know about many people like if you've ever reconnected with someone five years after you've like been friends with them or been close to them or anything else things are very different like nothing yeah. is going to be like you don't just seamlessly fall back into that world and think like oh we can be friends or people change after five years Especially mm -hmm. like in the context of Chloe in the first Life of Strange game, yeah. she's so different because of what she's seen. Like you could yes. kind of understand like the raw emotions that she shows, like the kind of the exhibiting of like abandonment issues um, with Chloe. I think the problem is it's like you have to contextualize her for who she is. So like I was talking about the kind of idea that if you reconnect with someone after five years, it's going to be a very different mm -hmm. experience, especially in Max's perspective. Mm -hmm. Chloe, you kind of have to like get into her shoes. And I think that's both easy and difficult task because you need to emphasize why she feels the way that she does. Mm -hmm. um, and why she's like so sometimes so loving, and then sometimes so abrasive. I think it's kind of like a reflection of her mood swings. Um, and then it kind of like it opens up those bigger conversations like we've we've spoken about before on, on the podcast as well. Like, you know, when people are always like always always Max and Chloe, they're they're the loving relationship. It has to be them two ships together. It's like, does she really love her in that way? It's like, does yeah. she really love her? Like the one, the more telling signs of that third episode when like uh, Max puts on Clo Rachel's clothes, it's it's kind of like a little bit, I don't know, yeah. a little bit disturbing as well at the same time because it's like you obviously you're projecting something here. It's like you can see with her, she's like quite like happy and visible. The fact that she's dressed up with Rachel, and it's like, hang on a minute, mm -hmm. it's like is is like is is Max really your love interest? Is like is she like just a friend to you? What are you doing? Are you filling a void? And you can see with Max as well the way that she acts in the first game. She's like. She always feels like she's on the kind of like the precipice of this relationship that Chloe and Rachel had. And it's like kind of questioning, do I interfere in it? Try, do I try and replace her? Um, yeah. And I think with Chloe, it's kind of like a little bit, of, uh, you know, it's a very hard character to relate to depending on who you are and what you've experienced in life. I think that's what makes her quite an interesting figure. And I think with Before the Storm, they mm -hmm. kind of like make her a little bit more, um, they kind of help flesh out kind of like one side of the argument which is like you shouldn't like really not like dislike her for no reason i mean they kind yeah. of like they and, and also at the same time then i kind of understand why people like they make max look bad because <laughs> it's like you know max is like ignoring I, I think that's the kind of conversation you get to basically in a nutshell you get to life is strange one it's like 
you have to understand the kind of like the time reference for these two characters and like what's happened in between it why their relationship has like kind of completely kind of fallen apart a little bit and then they come back together and then to put that into perspective if anything and i think if you don't have perspective of having an experience similar to that it makes it a little bit difficult because i like all the characters i like max rachel and chloe but then i understand why people think this character is toxic i think like i've always heard from people one or three of the characters is toxic if not more like they've always kind of had very mixed feelings with it but with chloe i kind of think you have to understand from her position like what it is i think like come on like she lost her dad when she's young then she loses her best friend yeah and then like you know she doesn't she re- she's like a rejection of like the dave madsen kind of like position of like someone coming into her life and it's like that you know as you said it's kind of like that 2015 punk rock kind of like a stay they gave yeah. her to kind of show she's a rebel without a cause and it's like you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think like yeah kind of have to understand like that that evolution point of like when you see her in different games it's like when you see the bts chloe it's mm-hmm. not the it's not the same chloe as the uh, the life is strange chloe and kind of it as well in hindsight kind of like the fact that ashley Birchett wasn't chloe in that game either i like that rihanna devries was chloe in that because it kind of gives a different yeah edge of a personality if anything um but yeah obviously farewell is the kind of condo i think i i know that that person i spoke to as well like, they really love farewell they were like this is incredible they really oh, they enjoyed did it play, uh, before the storm yeah so they they played they played the first life is strange they didn't like chloe in that. they yes. played before the storm they couldn't they just didn't like chloe in that at all they struggled really? to kind of get through it. yeah I, I, they, I, they just didn't like chloe as a character like they were yeah. like fully in the first life is strange they were like yeah i'm gonna choose to save her save the town yeah. not save chloe um yeah but in farewell they really enjoyed it i think like it hit like an emotional no mm. i think it hit like a a personal point of like you know you know one of those things what happens with a lot of people so i think they kind of like gravitated towards that but that's obviously the starting point for her story if anything like why she becomes who she does further down the line um yeah but yeah it's it's it's, it's a, it is an interesting one chloe because I've, I've always had that thing with people where you know, you've had the conversation of like, you know, who do you choose? Like, do you choose Town? Do you choose Chloe? I think it depends on how much you connect with her as a character. Like, she's the, the Don't Nod game was very clever with all the characters it dealt with, and especially with Max and Chloe. Like, they mm-hmm. project, they allow you to project things on these characters. I think that's like the best thing for like Chloe as well. Like, I think intentionally she's both like a dislikable but also likable character. Yeah. And I think like her her erratic behavior is explained by like an understanding to kind of like really get into her shoes. Like, I think that's the difficulty I have with Chloe to explain to people. It's like, you have to kind of get into her shoes and understand mm. things. It's like, it's like the, the father that she had died, her best friend abandoned, quote unquote, abandoned her, abandoned yeah. her when she was younger, her girlfriend slash other best friend has like gone missing and feels abandonment. It's like these issues are like being entrenched in her now. So it's like, you can kiss, kind of see the, the kind of flip side. It's like that, is that a conversation we had um, during the podcast where it's like, if you could add a scene to the series, what would mm-hmm. you pick and why? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then we had that kind of, um, the, the commenter who said like, you know, why don't you have that scene after the pool sequence, where there's the morning sequence afterwards with Max and Chloe. Oh, yeah. no, sorry, not after, when, when they went back to the house and there's like a nighttime yes. sequence. Maybe that imbalances the story at this point because then it kind of shows the flip side of Chloe when she wakes up in the morning and she's a little bit like, ooh, you know, this is great and blah, blah. And it's mm-hmm. like, ooh, you know, my, Chloe gets, um, Rachel gets, um, Max gets Rachel's clothes, etc. Um, I don't know. I think, I think Chloe is just a very, um, complex character. And I think it's hard to kind of break down who she is, like, as, as a person sometimes. And I think, like, that's why it's so, that's why you get, like, those videos. Like, I think it's like that really famous one. It's like, you know, Chloe, worst best friend kind of video that pops up on YouTube's algorithms quite a few times. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, I, I, if, if we have the conversation where you said the initial question, which was like, do you start, bts first or life is strange one i would always like gravitate towards someone playing life is strange one first just because yeah. i want you to kind of get your perception set in chloe yeah and then go from there and then and then bts kind of maybe changes your perception or even amplifies it it's i, I think i think that's the best way to approach i think you kind of have to see things first with the perspective of max caulfield and yeah. go from that um my friend, um, actually, I believe it was Marcus who had an interesting um, order in how you watch Star Wars, the um, the original trilogy and then the prequel trilogy, right? Um, he went uh, episode four, five, one, two, three, then six. Uh, and he said that, like, uh, yeah, I was just like, that's an interesting one because he says that, like, you know, four or five, 
And then once you hear that twist in five, you know, spoiler alert, Luke, I am your father, and it's Anakin Skywalker, right? Then you go into the the context of where Anakin came from and how he became Darth Vader. And that's where you conclude the series with uh, episode six, where he kind of explains himself and uh, Anakin is just like, I, I was uh, a horrible person. Uh, could you ever forgive me? The whole like, um, like taking off his helmet bullshit. But yeah, like that was his take. You go four, five, one, two, three, then six to like set your place who Darth Vader is and then get an explanation of who Darth Vader is and then finally conclude Darth Vader's story. Yeah, that is really quite interesting. I've never heard anyone do four, four, five, one, two, three, six. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting that you left the, the and ending. And you forget the seven, eight, nine exists. You just, yeah, you just... well, I've repeatedly said that to people many, many times that Disney would butcher the hell out of that franchise, and they did as well. Yeah. And that though, that new wave of trilogy was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Um, Definitely. Yeah, that's an interesting concept, that, if you're doing four, five, one, two, three, six, because you're basically like, yeah, you're edging off that, and then you need to give your, you're trying to give backstory, then aren't you, to Vader, and give yeah. a, a deeper meaning. And, and technically as well, that kind of does work as well because then obviously if you're watching a certain version of it and you're watching Hayden Christensen and then he's yeah. like modified into the CGI of the end of the sixth film, then it yes. does become a little bit more feelable for it. Yeah, that is quite an interesting one for how it yeah. works. I think like because obviously like the Vader the Vader arc was obviously fleshed out massively by George Lucas in the first three Star Wars films and to really kind of give him perspective because like it's it's a very it's a very like simple story as well at the same time Star Wars because it's like. Uh, you know, man who's God who turned to bad then turns back to God kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I think like that's, yeah, that's that's quite an interesting perspective to point into something like that. I think Chloe maybe might be the same depending on how you see her. It's, it's, I always find it quite interesting that obviously the majority of people is always like Chloe is God or like they like her. But then mm. also there's, there's a large fraction of people who just don't like her. And I kind of understand it from that perspective. I get why she comes across as a little bit abrasive. I get why she, you kind of wouldn't want to associate yourself with her. Get why you want to do this, but <coughs> ultimately the conversation kind of again starts for me that this is the coming of age story of Max Caulfield, mm -hmm. and it's like at any point you reconnect with someone five years later after that kind of event, there's a lot. There's a lot there. You know, this the, is it, I think was it the first Life of Strange game set in seven days or something? Set in a very short time. Frame. Five days. Five days. Like, set in a very very short time frame yeah and it's like you're now catching up on five years of history between these two people and it yeah. ended on a very like you know rough note of the fact that max leaves arcadia bay after chloe's yeah. dad dies and it's like how much do you really know about someone in between that um and and, and, and i think as well i think in, in itself as well i think why chloe comes across as bad sometimes is because how, how um max is portrayed as well because like she seems to be in the first game like reaching out to like chloe and like really trying mm -hmm. to like be a friend and stuff but then again it doesn't i think bts does both good and bad things as well and i think that i like that it's kind of like both it makes max look a little bit bad but at the same time it's like nah chloe's still you know chloe that you knew from the first game as well i think it's like we're kind of like we're not going to give you an, an either or side of who's right and wrong here it's like both characters are in in I, I, like you know um you know, both characters are responsible for their own actions, if anything. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's an interesting one that I, I don't know. How would you feel about it now, though? Would you prefer play, like, in hindsight, would you want it to play BTS first and then Life is Strange 1? Or do you like the order that you played it in, which was the first Life is Strange and BTS? I kind of liked the order I play them in just because, like I said before, as, um, as narrative writing goes, I think there's more impact to uh, ask for forgiveness of uh the actions rather than like explaining the actions you know mm. um i i think there's a lot more impact in saying like okay this is where chloe came from in terms of like almost like a case study than anything else um <laughs> i i think that's uh, a lot more impactful however that doesn't take away from if you wanted to play before the storm first and then life is strange uh just to get that context i think there's a flow that goes within the story is this kind of flow of um like the downfall of chloe into madness i guess you want to say uh mm. so there's explanation versus case study and i and i tend to go for the case study uh effect which is why i like that four five one two three six uh order of star wars like almost like a case study than anything else um but i prefer playing it life is strange and then before the storm but if you want to play before the storm and then 
Life is Strange, you know. I did a whole Let's Play on Games of Groceries of uh, the chronological order of mm. uh, Life is Strange games. So, um, yeah, I did. I played it in chronological order, and I still prefer, you know, the release order anyway. Yeah, I think I think it's a bit clearer in terms of how you see it. I think like the best thing to kind of address is that you go and play it in release order, but then you understand what you're playing as well. I feel like mm. you really need to home around home the point that it's, it's 2015. It's a coming of age story. It focuses on yes. because like I think <clears> if you play BTS first as well. It it does do a little bit. It, I think you can change your perception of Chloe in, in Life is Strange one because then like for example, if you look at the mood swings that Rachel throws in that game. You can kind mm. of almost say like that's transplanted onto Chloe by the time you get to the first Life is Strange, but it's not yeah. necessarily the case either because Chloe's erratic as it is. So I think like people would be like, well, I kind of hate Rachel more here because like she's made Chloe the way she is because she did a mood swing with her, and obviously it's exactly. like transplanted onto her. Um, but that's not the case though. It's like you basically, I think like in in very much like as I saw it very early on playing the first Life is Strange, uh, Chloe is very much mad with Max for like a lot of the game. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like, well, you kind of have to understand why she's mad with her. And it's like, it's both, or she's also one, ampl- like, you know, overblown the situation, Chloe, but then also Max is also in the wrong as well for like not having been her friend. And then Max even says as well, she's like, I wish I would have been there for you, blah, blah, blah you know, et cetera. So it's kind of like this, like, you know, a little bit of guilt tripping, but then also self-awareness that she should have been there for Chloe. Um, yeah. But I always find Chloe Price a very interesting character. I find like she's she's an interesting character, and then I find it very interesting that she's played by Ashley Birch as well. Um, and obviously, when I was covering it during the time it's coming out, twenty fifteen, I remember reading Ashley Birch's essay about her 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 late partner who passed away, mm-hmm. um, and how like it really hit her because of how she was playing Chloe. So I think like her kind of view of things. I think I think I think loss is a factor that has to be attributed to Chloe. And I think if, for example, you've lived a, a sparkling life for most of your life. Mm-hmm. And you got to yeah. where you're at, and you never felt loss in that mm-hmm. scale. I think that causes you having a misconception of Chloe. I think you, yes, unfortunately, need to lose someone close, not a father, but someone in no. general. And I think that will hit you more with Chloe because then I think you become very automatically sympathetic towards her cause. That's how I see it personally. Yeah. Is your friend? Um, would you say that they experienced loss in this way, or um, I don't think so. No. Yeah. I I um I personally don't think so. Yeah, because I remember before I played this game. Yeah, the <clears throat> in terms of like who I lost, it was um a very close mentor of mine uh growing up, and he passed away like a few a few years before Life is Strange. So it's like one of those things like you had to experience like a loss. Like again, not like maybe not like a like a like a really immediate family member but i did lose like a pretty close mentor of mine uh before yeah. i played this um which is why i think you know i always defend chris in the way of just like i wanted him to be the the protagonist of life is strange 2 because i related so much to his story like to a t like that was where i was as a kid and it was just like man i i don't relate to the the <sighs> um Sean and Daniel team, you know, the Diaz brothers. I don't relate to this because mm. uh, they had a loving father who hugged them. But, it's, you know, it's just like one of those where it's like it, it definitely depends on your not only the cultural context, but your own context of life, you know, uh, that you don't really understand people, you know. Yeah, no, I think you, I think I think you're right with that. And I think even fills in with the Star Wars conversation you said before as well. Even if you want to go be bold enough to be like comparing Chloe and Darth Vader, but it's like yeah. even on the side of like the Vader arc story as well, like you can see that like, there's hurt on like loads of sides of it because it's even like Vader and like Anakin loses his wife or his partner, mm. wherever, wherever they're up to at that point with Padme, um, <clears throat> loses his partner. But then even there's like a mourning side from Obi Wan as well, so you can start to see where he's like he's lost a friend and yes. like his his friend is essentially dead. I, I I really like a lot of the Disney stuff afterwards, but um, Obi Wan the series was quite interesting as a TV show, and specifically the uh, the interactions between um, Obi Wan and Vader when they fight, and he realizes that his friend's dead, and it's yes. kind of like it's coming to, coming to terms with a piece of what's happened there. He's like holding on to the guilt of it, of like what happened to Anakin, but then also like Anakin's holding on to his own guilt of like you know killing his wife and then becoming this monster essentially. Um, and as he said that as well, your own experience. I think you have to. I think that's where where Life is Strange hits you more. I think it's lost. I think that's why, for example, 
uh, farewell is more potent mm-hmm. because people lose friends and yes. they lose things. And there's a there's such an innocence about um, farewell. Everyone, more or less, everyone has experienced that. And then mm-hmm. also there comes a turning point where they like become adults and stuff. They go back and play it, and the loss yeah. feels more significantly amplified in your experience. Um, you know, it's. Oh, I. I was, no, I was even I was even gonna say I'm watching Gilmore Girls for the first time ever. Oh really? And yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like I'm sitting down and I'm watching this. I'm like, how did anybody like this show? I'm on season five right now, and this is like, <laughs> how the hell did anybody enjoy this show? Who likes Rory and Lorelai? But <clears throat> I think it's also you know, I also see it from the perspective of like I'm watching it in 2023 for the first mm-hmm. time. I'm not yeah. watching it in the early 2000s when this was first coming out because um, now we're in the early like we're in 2023 where we're like really taking down old white men, right? And like we're we're seeing that context of just like it's the white guy, it's the old white guy that's all the problems here. And in Gilmore Girls, it's all these um. Like it's all just like women hating women, and it's just like, dude, it's it's Richard Gilmore. Richard Gilmore is like the the most toxic character on the show, and <laughs> and I'm talking to Liz about this. Like Richard Gilmore is like the, the worst. He's the old white man, the old white man. And she and Liz is just sounding like, yeah, but back in the early 2000s, we weren't thinking about the old white guy. We were thinking about like, oh, this this girl is attacking me, so I gotta attack her. I'm like, but Richard's the one. It it all has to do with the context of when it came out and how people thought of it. And uh, Lorelai Gilmore is the actual worst character that's ever been written on a TV show ever. And I'm just saying that I'm not saying that in a way of just like, Oh, like it's no, I'm saying Lorelai Gilmore is the worst character to ever be written ever, including Darth Vader, but <laughs> it is what it is. But I think it does matter in terms of like when you take in, because art is a time capsule. Art is, mm. um, Something that, that better example, better example. Um, I just uh had my friend watch the entire Rush Hour trilogy uh. and they just got to Rush Hour three and there there wasn't as much impact for them because mm. they didn't have that huge gap in between Rush Hour two and Rush Hour three, and they didn't have that cultural impact of just like 2007 was like the end of that kind of movie yeah. like that was when super bad came out that was the year before grandma's boy that was uh th- like this whole like this is the end of an era kind of like like raunchy movies i will say uh so they didn't get that impact they thought yeah. it was good but <laughs> not as good as it, we thought of it was in 2007 yeah i, I think um there's a lot of, a lot of questions and answers to be asked in there i think you're i think you're more invested in gilmore girls than liz if anything <laughs> like, i like, am because i'm just like why are why do people like this why did why did we not play richard what is going on why is emily gilmore so hot like god emily gilmore is just mm. that that's funny you mention all that and i think that maybe that might actually be an answer to the chloe price dilemma as well which is a time capsule for content and like what you're doing as well because i'm watching friends at the minute God rest Matthew Perry's soul. Um, yes. And I love Friends. And I, and I hate this conversation where people like hate on Friends. Like you can dislike it and you can think they could be better about the show. And sure. it might be. And I think because people like hear the public opinion about it, like it's, oh, it's overrated. Watching it now, by the way, Adam, it's so more relatable when you're an adult as well. Oh God, yeah. Like, yeah. oh my God, it's so much more relatable. But it's also the quick, quick fire sense of humor. And it's also so grounded in its time. Mm-hmm. It's like if you were, for example, growing up now, you want to kind of become a cultural connoisseur and you want to watch Seinfeld, for example, you're really going to have to understand like the time period you're watching Seinfeld. Liz just Same watched for it for the first time too. I made her watch it and there's just like, it, it still, it still holds up, but it's, it doesn't hit as hard as no. it did in the nineties. No, it does. But that's <laughs> the thing that, that won't, it, neither will the Simpsons early Simpsons seasons yeah. one through 13. Neither will, for example, rush out free, because as you said, it's in a period of like certain things happening I like mm. so much has changed. I like, even, for example, the first Life is Strange, like eight years have passed. Like you can't, we can't sit here enough on the podcast and explain all the even like minor things that have changed. Like I don't think, for example, like I spend time on TikTok sometimes endlessly scrolling, and you kind of see the sense of people being like, "Oh, I, I, I wish dating was a thing properly. Oh, I wish like 
I had friends, like very close friends. People don't have these experiences anymore because the world has evolved so much and it's transformed inside the internet, screen age. People don't have the kind of like the same mm -hmm. Max and Chloe position of like having a best friend at an early age or having yeah. like a really close friend. Or it's like they can't relate to these experiences because so much time has passed. Like it's so difficult because when you go on the internet and then see other people feeling it, you're like, hang on a minute. I understand, yeah. for example, why these kids are now kind of like feeling nostalgic about their grandparents meeting each other in a stand in a line for a coffee in New yeah. York City. That would never just it, like the likelihood of that happening really is like so low now, isn't it? Compared yeah. to where we were like 50, 60 years ago, because you kind of like change your entire cultural, social, everything landscape. So, for example, with Gilmore Girls, it's going to be a hard pull to swallow because like if you had watched it there in that time period, you're going to be like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. You're like, oh yeah. my God, this is so smart. It's so clever. I would say this people have like lost. I watched Lost about three years after it ended. I think it's mm. the most seminal, seminal piece of TV show I've made because it was in that time. Everyone's yes. now like, oh, it's a little bit like this. I'm like, well, the funny part is everything you say now is that that TV show has inspired every TV show you're watching now. So it's yeah, like, it you the might first think it might... cinematic TV show to be on broadcast. Like you didn't really get that kind of show where it's like a movie, movie-esque like cinematic drawbacks you know like it's it was the it was it was revolutionary like it, it, yeah that that's what that's why tv shows are so movie like now because of lost yeah that's what so like when when you work it out like that it has its its place so even with life is strange it has to be contextualized in 2015 and I, and I I just don't think people have that same experience now. Mm -mm. I really don't. I think like for me, and to put this in, and I always mention this in every podcast, I don't know what it is. It too. It part mm. two really hit me. Like, I don't know what, it, it, I think it was just the premise of it where it's like these, these kids who are very close, who've come together, but then it's like, they're kind of like, they, they, they disapparate after like a long period of time. And then they come back together as adults. It's like a little bit awkward when they're kind of meeting each other. It's been so long, et cetera, blah, blah. That experience hits me because I've had that in my life where I've, I've met someone after like four or five, 10 years or something. And it's like, this isn't going to work the same way it looks on paper. It's going to be like, you know, in, 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 on paper, it looks amazing. You can reconnect with this person. You can live life, blah, blah. It's not going to happen. And it happens with people yeah. in real life as well. When they reconnect with someone like 10 years later, because maybe they don't have that many friends anymore. And like, actually, I'll just speak to this person and see what happens. What, what, when you're seeing someone in front of someone after like five or 10 years, that ain't the same person. You've experienced mm. so many different things in your life. You've experienced so many different, you know, everything. Yeah. Everything changes. And I think that's the thing with Chloe. <clears throat> Sit down in front of her, and it's like, nah, yeah. it's, it's so different. Like, is she really care about Max? Does Max care about her? You know, where does this relationship go? Why do I dislike her? And I think, like, these all kind of come into pieces. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger conversation to be had. But I think, like, she's a very interesting character to, to talk about, nonetheless. I think she's, she's so multi-layered and multifaceted, And I think, like your perception of, on her for me personally is perceived mm -hmm. on your own personal experiences that's why i've always thought about life is strange it's built on your personal experiences because you can technically project yourself onto almost every character and especially the main character as well max if anything she's yeah. so like she's so like bl a little bit blank as well at the same time because she, you're you can step into her shoes so it's like you can choose to like chloe because your experiences have all been great in life or you could dislike oh, yeah. her because you've you've you know you know for whatever reason you just don't like her for that reason so yeah interesting nonetheless yeah it's it's definitely a, a good take for people who are just playing life is strange for the first time uh because you know it is cultural like a lot of and that's the other thing there's a lot of millennial like cringy dialogue uh. that are in this um thank god there's no zomg in this game like there's there's none of that there's no epic in this game kind of like deal but there's still like a lot of prime millennial cringe that's yeah. in this game that's very culturally context within the year of 2015 you know did you um did you feel old with my tiktok video i sent you or the taylor swift album and the kids travel i sent CD. that to liz and i sent that to my mom and i'm just like i sent that to my mom <laughs> so if you don't know the tiktok that adnan sent me was uh taylor swift like young taylor swift fans like they were like what 12 13 something like that yeah and they couldn't figure out how to get a cd out of the jewel case and i'm just like oh my god dude i'm just like and i said to my mom like officially millennials are dinosaurs because like yeah i man i still remember like i even struggled my first cd like when i first got it um that was like that was like a prime day for me and just like trying to get it out without breaking it 
and now I'm seeing it like almost almost like like um in that scene with um oh what was the interstellar in the interstellar with the bookcase yeah. you know, kind of thing like no <laughs> no you won't break it just pop it out like that that's what I felt like I was just like yeah we're officially dinosaurs now we really are I, I yeah. think like even when we talk about the Montreal game like they're using a VHS tape like an artifact. And it's yeah. like that that's what it is. Like, and even the logo of this hit, like show, you know, if you watched it as like a young kid, for example, you've somehow stumbled onto this podcast, and thank you if you have, and you're listening yeah. to this and you're 10 or 12, you might be looking at that thinking, what the hell is that? And it's like, yeah, that's a VHS play. That's a VHS tape. And yeah. trust me, the magic was born in those days as well. But it's yeah, like as you said, it's 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 very jarring, like Life is Strange One. It's, it's it's a millennial kind of like piece, if anything, the way it's mm. set. And the same with Life is Strange too. Those two don't know games are very much time capsules. Like you yes. have to have like if you go back and play, you you just won't Life is Strange 2 is like dated very differently, like in terms of I know. Your... And that's what I mean. <laughs> I wish I was in I was I wish I was in a better place in life when I was playing Life is Strange 2 for the first time. Like because it was it fit the timepiece of when it came out very well. Uh I just wish I was in a better place in life when I was like playing it so I could appreciate it. But it really is a time capsule. Like both these games are very much time capsules capsules of their time uh it makes me want 2015 back again oh well i I would like any time before like now at the minute it just seems to be like hell and back at times um and going back to like i think i think for me everything went downhill after the the financial crisis in 2008 like i I was too young to kind of experience it as an adult but everything since then just seems to be in like literally plateauing in a a not not horrible way but before we move on as well because we're going to spread the art i just want to ask you something because we're having this like general conversation about like all these like things and obviously if you are you know you try to work out our ages we are obviously both millennials i wanted to ask you what do you think like gen z would see from this game like life is strange one like the characters even like obviously because like Gen Z is now the older population. Like they're now yes. entering the workforce, for example. I and know it's now wild. Moved... Yeah, well, my 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 nephews and nieces are, are Gen Alpha, which is twenty twelve onwards. Which, like, you know, if that one makes you feel old, mm. like we're now yeah. into another generation. But like, I just wanted to think, like, from your experience of knowing Gen Z and like yeah. seeing Gen Z and the way that they act, what do you think of that they make of like this? Because like we have, I think maybe the most of the people that I've kind of spoken to and their perception of Chloe is maybe from a millennial experience. Mm-hmm um i can tell you right now if a gen z person played this david madsen will be way more of a red herring than anything else because he's Mm. an authoritative white man you know like he's very much like the enemy of what gen z (laughs) wants in life uh very authoritative mustache creepy uh (laughs) takes pictures of girls gen z would like take that red herring yeah like way more than we ever did (laughs) Um, mm. I think they'll also, <clears throat> I think they'll also relate to Max a lot more because she is a lot more, uh, shelter. She's a lot more closed off. And I think Gen Z is closed off in a way where even millennials, what we said, we were, um, uh, closed off. We were in- introverted. Gen Z is a little bit more introverted than millennials ever were just because we, I don't want to say like we touch grass, you know, because like Gen Z still touches grass, <laughs> but like they're very much, you know, screen oriented. And it, it's just the generation is. It's not bad or good. It's just that's how the generation was. We were AIM, okay? So like we were also screen oriented. We just didn't have access to AIM. If we had access to AIM like all the time, <laughs> we would be on AIM all the time. <laughs> um, So I think Gen Z is a little bit more closed off than millennials were growing up so i think they'll relate a lot to max uh in a way of yeah they they just don't want to be like around people a lot um they might they might crush on chloe they might crush on chloe honestly um like they they want more like max chloe relationship um but i don't know if they'll relate to chloe as much Mm. Uh, Chloe is very much a millennial punk, whereas Gen Z punk is a little bit more different. It's it's way different. Um, this is me working with Gen Z because you know I work as a line cook, so I get a lot of Gen Z people coming in. Uh, Gen Z punk <clears throat> isn't more out there. It's just it's it's actually going backwards uh, in a way. Like 
millennials were punk in the sake of punk in terms of music. But I think Gen Z punk is more Rage Against the Machine punk. They're going back to 90s punk where they're just standing for a cause and they're just like they're not they're not standing for anything else. They're actually doing something now. So I applaud Gen Z for the way they're handling punk versus millennials. It's like we're edgy, bro. Um, nothing to fight for. We're just edgy for sake of edgy. Um, so I think they won't relate to Chloe, but I think they'll like her style. But I, that's what I think. I think David Madsen will be much more of a red herring. They'll relate a lot to Max, and I don't think they would relate to Chloe too much, honestly. Yeah, that's that's interesting that you said that because, like, I, I think that I think I agree with it. I think I, I think Chloe would be the definition of slay for them. Um, yes. Just to, like make myself feel old with that. And it's like, as you said, like their 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 perception on punk and like emo and stuff is so different from mm. ours. But like, is it like we we do that for a heart? It's like this is that like exactly. And, and don't they do like that with like two hands or something? Like they they do uh, something. They do it something weird, yeah. Yeah, they they do completely different, like from how we do things. Even like when you do like phone, we do like this. And, yes. Like, theirs is like this. So it's like it's it's different from like the time pieces. But yeah, I mm -hmm. think like the Madison thing you said was really interesting. I think that would be accurate. I think I think that yeah, I think they would relate with Max more. I think that they'd mm. probably become quite introverted, especially from like a being a screen generation. And because we we yeah. weren't a screen generation, we became a screen generation because we had to learn to become a screen generation. Exactly. Because like our our generations prior to us, Gen X and Gen uh, and Boomers wanted us to learn the screen so we could kind of like adapt it into the into the the future. Yeah. So I think like for them, they kind of like naturally been born by it. They might even have a kind of perception of why there aren't more screens in the game, for example. Why like yeah. there's not like more kind of texting. Except they might even see things a bit different from texting as well they might even think for example your millennial thing like her saying no emoji is very cringe as well oh, a yeah. bit more cringe than than what what you do um because i've, I've noticed as well like I've, I've i've had enough time to kind of like do my historian studies and even like you can learn that their vocabulary is very different so like if they send you certain emojis it's kind of like passive aggressive so even like the mm -hmm. natural smiley face emoji just like a blank smile is like passive aggressive when like when they're sending in a message or something yeah um, but no, it, uh, interesting though, nonetheless. And yeah, if you are a Gen Zer and you are here, you know, let us know mm -hmm. what you think of um, Chloe Life as well. That would be interesting yeah. as a perspective. I think it's 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 obviously that as, as we've always spoken about. You know, we're both men in our thirties and like you know millennials, yeah. so like we have a different kind of context in it. But yeah, if you are Gen Z and you somehow like found this podcast, and you're listening. If you leave us in the comments what you think of Chloe, I'd be really interested to hear about that. Um, okay, I think we can wrap that up. Very interesting conversation, nonetheless. And I think we can kind of we'll probably do a couple more on other characters as well the rachel mm -hmm. amber will be quite extraordinary as well <laughs> but yeah. anyway um we'll move into the spread of the arts um adam do you want to go first uh yeah sure um you know i always say you know i always drop whatever music i i do so i guess i'll do it here uh 34th street it's dropped it's my first single of the christmas album that's coming out uh not much to say on this one i thought it'd be a good first single uh, but hmm. this is the the one that I did almost like an exercise on, where uh, a lot of lo-fi beats, like all the tips I've gotten about lo-fi beats, they're just like, just don't think about it. Just do it. Just don't think about it. Put it out. And that's what I did. I wrote this song without kind of thinking about what I was doing, and I did it within uh, four hours, I think. I think I just sat down for four hours, and I just wrote this song, and I just put it out. Um and so far people are liking it and it's like one of those things that talking about like not even just the concept of the song but i think it's more of just like concept of life where just like the less you think about something the the better it is uh i found that the songs that i thought the more like the most about i'm not going to point out which songs they are because i don't want you to be like oh but that one's good <laughs> the, the the songs that i really put a lot of thought into people didn't really jive with but the songs that I just kind of, yeah, you know, just didn't think about it, just put it out, you know, people jive with. So I think that's a lot about life in general. Um, but yeah, 34th Street, it's out now. Um, first of two singles. Second single is coming out November 17th. Uh, but the real Spread the Arts, I finally got Liz to agree to watch a movie that I've been waiting to watch with her. And I haven't watched it. And I've waited five years to watch this movie searching holy hell searching. searching yeah if you haven't seen it there's a there's a new movie out uh called missing it's from the same writer i haven't seen that one but searching hasn't been on streaming services in a while but i found it at best buy 
you know, for eight bucks, I think I, I want to say a Blu-ray for eight oh, bucks. Oh, I've seen this film. It's damn, dude. It's so good. It's so good. Uh, the twist uh, with all of it. It's a it's not a spoiler. It's a twist. It's a it's a mystery. So, of course, there's a twist. The twist made me throw the pillow across the room. Like I literally yelled what and I just threw Spies, the no. pillow. Oh my god, it's so good. And it's so refreshing in a way of direction because it's all filmed or like the the whole direction is on a computer screen. So like your chat aim, even the drone shots are news segments that you see mm. on a computer screen. So it's all within the realm of a screen. Everything. Uh so it's really wild in that direction. I think the writing is like really well done and from what i've seen about the writer this is his first big movie like this yeah. is his first like like he's done short films but this is his first movie right so for him to do something like this first try essentially i know it's like you know he's done he's done this before it's not like his very first try ever but it was astonishing. I, I, I wish I saw this movie earlier, but like Liz was just like, what? It's all filmed from the screen. Like, yeah, it's really good. She's like, I don't know. And then she finally watched it. She's like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> she's like, I'm so sorry. I disagree with this. It was, it's excellent, dude. So if you're in, if you're at a movie store and you see searching on Blu-ray, get it, watch it, do it now. It's, it's really excellent. Yeah, I um, I, I I couldn't remember it. when you said it. I was searching, I was like searching, searching. As soon as I pulled up the post, I was like, I yeah, I know John Cho. I was like, I I, I recognize John him Cho, there. yeah. I, was like, I recognize oh. him from that film as well. Yeah, I I really enjoyed this. This was in the same vein as those um, those like lap um, I can't remember what the other film's called now. Oh, it's like it's where it's sat on like a laptop and it's telling a story through all the oh, it, it's uh... like the, the screen life film genre which you kind of like has spawned up for like last ten fifteen mm. years. Um, I yeah, can't remember I, actually what it's called. I can't remember. I know what movie you're talking about. Yeah, it's, I can't it's, remember told, what it's, called. it's like a way he like finds unfriended, unfriended. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. It's like thank God yeah. for Wikipedia. Unfriended is the one that's there's like unfriended. There's a couple of others as well. Like I, I feel like this genre should have had more life than it did. It seems yeah. like uh, like it seems to have been like really hit and miss and kind of come and gone. But yeah, miss. Um, searching is very good. I enjoyed it. I know that mm -hmm. I'm looking at it on Wikipedia. There's a standalone installment that came out called Ron. And a follow up oh. to both prior movies called Missing, which was released in 2013. Yeah, I, I haven't seen Missing, but now I'm interested in watching Missing. Yeah. Yeah, I wanna, I'm actually going to try and watch these later today, actually. <laughs> Run and yeah. Missing, I will try and watch. Yeah, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's a very smart film. And it's very well done. And it's, and it's a very, it's not the biggest budget in the world. And it's obviously done well at the box office, but we yeah, 100% recommend it. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, I'm glad that you caught up on that as well. But yeah, I remember watching it. Good, good, yeah. good choice as well. Um, so spread the spooky arts is now over. So I'll obviously yeah. give you my my pick. There were quite a few things I was going to recommend, like you know, the Expanse or Archangel. I think more so if any films would be Spider Man Two. I finished it. Mm. I was done with it. Completed it all. Um, it's probably one of the best superhero games ever made. Um, yeah, like if you probably PS Five. Yeah, if you have a PS Five, um, yeah. it's probably like one of the best superhero games ever made. It's probably just behind Arkham City for me, if anything. But it's it's absolutely outstanding. They did a really great job in Somniac Games. The only issue that I have in as well, and I'll say this is many times over, is that the bugs. Are... Oh, Damn. This is a this is an infliction of modern day video games, Adam. It's an infliction yeah. of modern day video games, and you're gonna have to accept it. Like 37 gigabyte day one patches, and then it still has bugs and issues in between, which I found during the game. It's like, yeah. you know, that's that's not... intense. Yeah, I've heard so the same it's just... thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's just frustrating to have it in these kind of video games, and I'm like not really keen. On, oh, you know, it's a, it's a damning position of the gaming industry where it's going to go as well, and what happens as well. But nonetheless, enjoyed it. It was a great game. If you are reluctant to pick it up, I would definitely go and like scout it out. It's better than the first one for me. If anything, I yeah. went back and played 2018 Spider Man afterwards because I'm like just finishing up the trophies and stuff on that. And oh my god, it's like so jarring the mechanics on the first game. <laughs> like oh, now yeah. after playing. Like the swinging is so much more smooth and consistent, and it's like, damn, it's like this. We finally feels like we're in current generation console territory after spending yeah. like four or five years making cross gen games. But yeah, I recommend it. Great story, uh, great pieces. There's a there's some there's some questionable things that happen in the game as well. Actually, as well, I think there's one point where there's a, a forced promotion as well. Mm -hmm. So um, 
Miles Morales changes his suit, and this is a little bit of a spoiler, but it's a it's a promotion for Adidas, the sports brand oh, maker. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's cringe. It's it's deep, which cringe. is weird. I, I remember when they um when they released that that he's in Adidas, but in the comics he's famous for his Nike Jordans. So it's wild that in this game it's Adidas. Yeah, yeah. This uh, that's like <laughs> yeah. That's bit, that, that's like, that's the opposite of Michael Jordan at this point. Where it's like yeah, <laughs> they've gone yeah, the, complete opposite. They got yeah. the, the brand. Yeah, I, I I don't like him. Like, do you want if you want to mm. like if you want to do the, the promotional thing, you have to do it smartly. So yeah. I used to like find like a lot of joy of like Kojima doing it in Metal Gear Solid Four. Like you have oh, yeah, Apple iPod, Monster. you have like yeah, you have like all these like little goofy <laughs> things in it. But it's goofy though. But it's yeah. like this is obviously placed as a yeah, and this this feels like a product placement. And it also yeah. seems to have like some ethical questions about it. Like can mm. can video games do this really? Can they actually yeah. like force adverts into it? Because like I don't know about you, but I feel mm. really worried about the advert generation that's coming up because it's like currently youtube is trying to block adverts like ad blockers at the minute and then also netflix has like an ad tier subscription model yeah and it feels like the next service it feels like every <coughs> service is now going to get into like ad tier ad 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 free subscriptions or ad yep. tier subscriptions or something like that and i'm like we already see enough adverts as it is i don't want to yeah. see any more it's like stop exactly. it and it's like especially my game's all when it's forced like that i'm like nah I'm not gonna i'm yeah. not gonna believe it but nonetheless yeah recommend it if you haven't played spider-man 2 it's definitely a game that you should pick up during the winter period it'd be good to play um but yeah i think we can call it a wrap here on spread the, uh spread the arts and also on strange cast so again if you are new here and you did enjoy the video please do consider dropping subscribe turn on notifications like the video and share with your friends help support the channel helps keep up to date with the channel Strangecast is also available for all podcast services. It's available on Spotify with the video version and everything else in between it. Uh, one final reminder as well, we dropped an interview with Lily Hokama, who was Khan in The Expanse, a Telltale series, and um, that is available available on YouTube only as well, so do check that out. And obviously our re- two recent episodes of Strangecast as well with Zachary Andrews and Stefan Frost, do please check them out as well if you are new here. Um, but in the meantime, we'll see you later this month with another episode of Strangecast. Again, let us know your thoughts. Chloe in the price in the comment section. If you're Gen Z, definitely let us know your thoughts about Chloe Price in the comment section. But until then, take care. We'll see you later. Bye. See ya. Ready for the mosh pit, Shaka Bravo.